Ignatius Press and the Augustine Institute present The Formed Book Club. Catholic book lovers unpacking good books chapter by chapter. If you like us, please help us by subscribing and by reviewing us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you might listen. And don't forget to sign up for weekly updates and study questions at formedbookclub.ignatius.com. Welcome back to the Form Book Club. We now have Vivian with us in-house after her long trip to Chicago. I'm glad to see that. We are going to begin discussion of St. Augustine's City of God, not the entire thing as such, but rather selections, introduction. I don't know if I'm about those, but I believe, Joseph, you wanted to make a concluding remark about some musical thing? I did. I've forgotten. I'm sorry. Forgot what it was. Okay. Do you remember what, what it was he said? Okay. We'll start on this end, and uh, I will just say this, uh, I think, and I'm not alone in thinking this, that Augustine's City of God is one of the foundational works of Western civilization. And I have tried several times to read it, but in its full version, it's about a thousand pages, and it's full, a lot of details about Roman history and Roman gods and goddesses and battles and so on. And I could just never, it was just too much, too daunting for me. So when I realized that Hans Joseph Balthasar had taken the city of God and made an abridgment, I thought, well, okay, this, this looks like it's worth doing. And as he does, typically he did it with Origen, for example, he did it with the Irenaeus. He doesn't just abridge it and leave out things. He organizes thematically. And I can't compare this with the city of God in its fullness because I haven't read that thing. I just never would get through it. But I would say this is is phenomenal and it's something that probably, you know, every person who wants to say I'm part of Western civilization should be familiar with. I, I just think it's great. I agree. And I would even go further. Uh, classic Balthazar putting his stamp on this. It's not only a foundational work, as you just said, but as he says, Bob Balthasar, that is, on page 11, um, this work is at least helpful to us in our hour of decision. You know, that is so Balthasarian, the idea that every Christian actually has to make a decision for Christ. You know, the, the idea that you're just, I don't know, keeping a pew warm or that's where my dad sat and I'm sitting there now too, or whatever, as much as that might have value for the continuity of a culture and so on, a real Christian has to make a decision for Christ. And why does Von Balthasar want us to read the city of God with his help? Because he thinks that can actually help us in understanding what we're choosing when we choose to be a Christian. Well, let's stay on that page, because he, he, that, on that page, he gives a very important kind of preparatory remark here about four lines down. He said, should the work, that is the city of God, be left in its historical framework, or should it be presented in its topical relevance, but, but lose its contemporaneity with its time? And he, he answers that question below. Can we reflect on the past it is palpable shock at the coming end of Rome as a world power as an analog to the present, which seems to contain an equivalent sense of shock and of danger. And he's right, what is, what is he writing this thing? Uh, uh, I mean, he, he's very prescient about this. Uh, the German text. 1960. 1960, okay. So, you know, he's 60 years ago. Uh, if we can compare the different ages, and indeed we can, there still remains the question of whether we can declare ourselves satisfied by Augustine's solution, or since no age can make decision for another, whether this work, as you cited, is at least helpful to us in our hour of decision. And I want to make a connection with what you've said about Tolkien so often, and Tolkien said it himself not allegory, but applicability. And so I, I think the city of God is applicable to our own time, especially when we're seeing world powers in decline, some of them, one of them anyway. Mm -hmm. Joseph? 
Well, the first thing I have is is just um, uh, on page seventeen. So I got, I got six. I got sixteen. Bottom of yeah, page sixteen. So I'm, happy, I'm happy to wait until my term comes. Very, the last four lines of page sixteen. Augustine's intention. This is good to know. You know what mm -hmm. all those other things his intention is mm -hmm. will be to accomplish something entirely different from Morosius, a justification of historical Christianity and historical Christian existence on the basis of an ultimately super-historical interpretation of history. So, looking at history from above history, from point of view of faith. And, and the reason why that's important is because the body, uh, the city of God, which is basically the body of Christ, is both here and now, and not yet here and now, and, and is the same is in the sense that God is the same through time and yet goes through changes. And so to situate the Christian decision of faith in both here and not here, now and later and yet to come, to understand that that is the context in which you're living out your life in Christ is so important in order to not be swayed by sort of heretical movements of thought that like we're going to build utopia, yeah, or, you know, or, yeah, or, or absorbed in to the, the world, world as it is yeah. because it's already whatever we think it is. And so, yes, this is why this is so foundational a work. Joseph, page seventeen. Yeah, and basically, it's it's just, it's just um, uh, reinforcing what both of you just said. But the beginning of this of the, of the, the part two, there, the second section, um, the first four books. Of the second part cover not the historical but the transcendental heavenly origin of the kingdom of god the last four not the historical end of the world rather the eschatology that has its telos in the same transcendent transcendence only the four middle books describe the historical appearance of the kingdom of god which is eternal in itself and therefore any historical element is located outside of its actuality in alienation or on pilgrimage. So a, a couple of things there. I mean, that whole idea of seeing history, including, I would say, by the way, the city of man, uh, in, in terms of eternity. Um, uh, therefore, that we, we're going to have this sense of alienation as something implicit or indeed explicit in the very fabric of both the city of man and the city of God. Um, city of God because of our absence from it, but desire for it. City of man because it's not home, however much we try to make it home. Uh, and therefore, that uh, our, our time in time is uh, ipso facto a pilgrimage. And, I, and, and I've got a new book coming out with Ignatius, um, uh, the Faith of Our Fathers, uh, The History of True England, and it begins with True and Timeless England, as a prologue, and it ends with an epilogue, true and timeless England revisited. Because what I try to do is exactly this Augustinian understanding of the city of man, the city of God, from my own particular nation's history, because I think it's applicable to all nations as it is to all history. Amen. I want to have something on page 27. Anybody before there? Well, I had... I would like to just look at this on 18 because the most astonishing statement almost uh, to sort of snap you to the reality that Von Balthasar wants you to understand the kingdom of God. This is the second paragraph. The kingdom of God, which comes from heaven, is on earth from the beginning. It is founded in Abel. It does not in any way or respect develop. Rather, at most, it emerges more strongly here and there from its concealment. I just had to take a step back when I read that, that the city of God is already here, has always been here, meaning in God's creation, and, and, and that it goes through different periods of being more or less concealed. And that's something we're thinking about. It is. It, it echoes St. Paul and Colossians, our, our lives are hidden with Christ mm -hmm. in God, that we're already in heaven and we're all united with the kingdom, mm -hmm. but we're, we're working it out in time. It's just been revealed. It, it, as here and there, 
uh, as it emerges more strongly here and there from its concealment. From its concealment. So we, we are, we are already in the kingdom of God, but it's concealed. But when we try and do things rightly and well and follow the commandments, then it emerges a bit from its concealment. Yeah. I mean, the concealment is that, that, that that's what separates the church militant from the church stuff and the church Robinson, because this is the, this is the veil of tears, as in V-E-I-L, you know, where we're not fully in the presence of God. There is this mask, there is this barrier that separates us from him. Yes, he's present in us, but we're not fully present in him. This, this, this comes come after death, death if, you know, if, if we, we are good soldiers, soldiers this side, this side, side of death. death. Anything before 27? I'm going, I'm going to defer, otherwise I suspect we'll never get through this book, because, I mean, there's so many, so many good things here that all we right. can talk about. Well, yeah, all right. Well, we'll, we'll try and proceed uh, expeditiously here. Middle of the page there, he says, Augustine places large question marks next to the political structure of all great empires, mm -hmm. which almost endemically fall prey mm -hmm. to the demonic ideals of earthly power and worldly prosperity. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? That doesn't seem, oh, that oh, doesn't oh, seem oh, very clear, does it? Uh, <laughs> by far, the best solution appears to Augustine to be the peaceful federation of small states, federalism, and more broadly, any form of society that remains most closely related to the political archetype of the national family. Man. Yeah. And that's very Aristotelian. And from what I understand, Augustine didn't have Aristotle, Aristotle no. but he had Plato. Yeah. Uh, and he is Neoplatonic in that in that sense. So uh, to see this emerge in Augustine, um, these are very old, wise ideas. <laughs> right. and, and I suppose we can even say an analogously, because Aristotle obviously was also uh, a Platonist that developed from Plato. Right, I so it that. Might, might be a case of great minds thinking alike here. Yeah. That, uh, even if you have Augustine who knew nothing about Aristotle, he's coming to similar conclusions, right? Yep, that's right. So, and, you know, reading through this, you know, I just saw so many ideas, so many expressions of Augustine, which are woven into our view of the world mm -hmm. uh, as Christians in the West. Uh, Again, that's why this is called the foundational work, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. You know, it's... Uh, and, how, and how much is actually original with him? I'm not certain. Uh, but even what's not original, he's bringing into a Christian synthesis. I mean, that's what makes this thing, you know, so wonderful. It's a, it's a synthesis an overview of history based on these principles, which go back to Plato and Aristotle, but in fact have been elevated in Christ in Christianity. That's all I got uh, Anything else? I have, page, I have page 33 next. If oh, that go is ahead. Right. Well, it's about eight lines down. I mean, people don't normally think of Hans Urs von Balthasar as being epigrammatic like Chesterton, but we have a short sentence here, which is, you know, really brilliant. And I should certainly use this or steal it or borrow it or whatever. Um, this is Augustine's basic tendency to oppose the two kingdoms as the kingdom of Caritas and the kingdom of Cupiditas. You know, so the, the, the two types of love, and that's just brilliant, uh, succinct, you know, I mean, it's something that's just going to stay with you. I mean, it's wonderful. And so what, you know, the other thing you can't help but hearing all through this Von Balthasar is a Jesuit and, um, and uh, a very close student of Ignatius and the um, exercises. Oh, yeah, the two, two and standards. so the two flags, the two standards, in other words, so this, this caritas versus cupiditas, this is the battle that has to be waged in every heart over and over and over again. And that's one reason why there is no making on this earth this perfect kingdom because every individual has to go through this battle for himself and you, you know learn the same lessons over and over and over again and so i keep hearing throughout this whole introduction mm -hmm. the two flags of ignatius of loyola in this introduction well, by the whole thing. The city, of, city of god city of man that, that's the whole book that's, that's the whole theme that's yeah. the whole thing structure one of my numerous sins of omissions i've never ever yet either read or done the spiritual exercises so again mea culpa 
Well, I mean, seeing how well you've come out so far, you, you, you would just in, increase immensely if you did that. <laughs> Anything more the introduction? Well, I have another uh, von Balthasarian von epigram at the top of page 37. I just also love, because it's also a Chestertonian paradox. <laughs> uh, top, top, top of page 37 there. Every Christian is called to rule over the world. I mean, very, very short, very simple. We're not, we're not meant to be ruly. Uh, we're not meant to be worldly, but we are meant to rule over the world. In other words, we have to overcome the power of the world within our hearts in order to actually be part of the city of God, not the city of man. Again, I don't know what that is, eight, nine words? I mean, brilliant. Okay. Uh, right, and he qualifies that in such yes. a way that he, the Christian, only makes use of the worldly without surrendering himself to it. And now you hear St. Paul, be of this world, be uh in the this world, world but not, not of, it. of it, by the, 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 the renewal of your minds, the transformation in Christ. So that's the other thing I keep hearing, actually echoing over and over, is Paul. Yes. Yes? Yes, but you want to... You wanna, I know, what happens is, now I've underlined, 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 I can't find anything to quote, because <laughs> <laughs> I get so carried away. Yeah, no, but this one I actually put a star by, the one that you just read, Joseph. Um yeah, it's astonishing. I love it. And if I can, you said about any, any introduction. If I could say one more thing right at the end here, just because it's very, I'm quite, you know, sort of drawing analogies with Chesterton. I'm going to keep within my comfort zone here. But now with, with Tolkien, because on, on page 42 and 43 here, this discussion about to what extent can there be dialogue with the pagan pantheon? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and, and we've got, you know, about, 40, uh, two thirds of the way down the page, page 42. You know, um, on the one hand, Holy Scripture does describe a world of angels and demons, which Augustine in no way could relativize by a situate within the history of religion, and which also, in a certain sense, mediates between God and the human world. If the pagan middle beings could be understood in this sense, they would then clearly be creatures, then it would be possible to negotiate about the gods. In fact, in the conversation with Apuleius, the point does come where Augustine, looking more at the content and at the words, wonders whether an agreement about the middle beings is possible. Uh, if Holy Scripture calls those redeemed by divine grace gods, if it speaks of the true God as the ruler in the council of the gods, if it speaks of the angels as the, uh, or, of the nations as demons, then why divide on questions that seem merely terminological. So uh, again, it's a large part of Tolkien's mythos that what are called gods are not really gods at all, they're angelic beings, right? They're mediators, supernatural mediators between God and man. Um, and again, to see, um, obviously it's not, Tolkien's getting this from Augustine, I assume, I and mean, he's obviously a classicist um, as well as a medievalist and, um, but it, I love I love that the fact that we can dialogue fruitfully because if the gods are merely creatures, then they're not God. <laughs> I mean, I don't have to worry about them at that point, right? <clears throat> so um, the prologue is very briefly what he has here. I just want to add one oh, more oh, thing from the introduction on page forty-four. Uh, Balthazar says something very explicit about how he wants us to read his text. Okay. And that is the last paragraph. The systematic selection of texts arranged here requires a contemplative reading and processing. So um, I took that, to, when I read that, I, I, I realized, okay, I need to have my contemplative hat on, even though that's probably my fallback position anyway when I'm dealing with things that are so far above me and I just need to, you know, I, I, find, it so <laughs> I find it so providential, Vivian, that we've, we've chosen this text at the beginning of Lent because I can actually make this my Lenten reading every day and do it at a leisurely pace and not be rushing to get the reading done, the highlighting passages frenetically before we, we do the recording. So this is, this is providential to me. Excellent. Well, the prologue is very brief here. 
this first section, the meaning of creation, I mean, that is food for contemplation for sure. And I'm not sure how she would handle it because I, I don't want to rush through the, that, that first section here, but I don't want to spend too more than our, let's just go as far as we can in that section. But I've got about six or seven things I want to quote and comment on. But first, the prologue, I always like when authors tell us what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, not always do they achieve what they said they were going to do, but you can measure at least what they did do with what they say they're going to do. So on page 47, he says, in this work, my dearest son Marcellinus, I have taken up the task of defending the most glorious city of God. So that's, he wants to defend the city of God. Well, that's great. We, we could use some defense. <laughs> uh, meaning of creation. Oh, I see. But, oh, you want to oh, oh, well, go ahead. But sorry. Here's, oh, here's, oh, I'm sorry. You first, Vivian. You first. Here, Augustine is saying, I want to defend the glorious city of God. And then in the second paragraph, he says, for I know very well what efforts are needed to persuade the proud how great the power of humility is. <laughs> so now we already see one of the defining characteristics of the city of God, humility. Yeah, and he, I, I highlight the same thing. That's what I was going to say as well. We can just read the next sentence, though, because, but by humility, we reach a height. So there's the paradox. If you want to kiss the sky, you have to kneel. A height not grasped by human arrogance, but granted by, but granted by divine grace. In other words, humility is only possible if we cooperate with grace, which transcends all these earthly pinnacles that totter with the, with the shifts of time. So he really set the whole thing here in, you know, in, 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 in genetic terms. <laughs> as in Genesis, you know, um, that, uh, that it's all ultimately about the original sin uh, and its antidote, right, between um, humility and its absence, you know, pride. And it, that ultimately, that is the city of man, the city of God. The city of, the city of God is only attained with humility. The city of man is ruled by pride. I mean, it's summed up there in the prologue. Mm -hmm. All right, can we... Oh, you have something here too? No, that's right. That's right. We can keep going. For the prologue, um, the very beginning, you know, the first, now this is Balthazar's title, the medium of creation, and God works all things. And he begins here We worship the God who assigned to all the natures he created, both the beginnings and the endings of their existence and their moving. So from motion from beginning to end who holds knows and regulates the causes of things who established the power of seeds who bestowed the rational soul i mean god the creator and he just he he, he just summarizes this. and then later on the bottom of the page who established the earth and made it fertile who bestows its fruits on animals and men, who knows and ordains not only primary but also secondary causes. So God knows all, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Yeah. Uh, this is us. And what, what messes it up, of course, is, as he says on page 51, is, is not the good that God makes but the will that we abuse um so again that's seven lines up from the bottom of page 51 but just as he is the creator of all natures so is he the giver of all empowerment again that word empowerment now in, in the culture of pride right you empower yourself you're not empowered by god but he is not the giver of all wills evil wills most certainly are not from him for they are contrary to nature which does which does come from him so again the whole it, it just in two sentences basically that the evil will is what separates us from reality because god is reality but yes you know, he, he, set, he sets the foundation for that in the middle of that page where he says moreover even if there is a fixed order of all causes for god it does not follow that as a consequence nothing depends on the choice of our will in fact our wills are themselves included in the order of causes that is fixed for God and contained in his foreknowledge. That's important. It's very important. Because this whole idea, well, if God knows everything, he knows what I want to do, right? Well, he knows what I'm going to choose to do freely because he's not, there's no before or after in him. 
but it doesn't make my choice determined because God knows what my free choice is. Yes. And by the way, this, this is a, a major uh, theme for Augustine in all his writings, this idea of predestination, free will, God's foreknowledge, and so on. And he's, he's, he's phenomenal. I was reflecting on it. Um, we, probably, we kind of spent a half hour already. Mm -hmm. Actually, 25 minutes so far. We started at 5.05. Okay, let's go five more minutes. What a caveat, we go five does more minutes. He, does he say time. somewhere here in this section on uh, will and foreknowledge that um, he he knows, God knows all, he knows the evil that we choose even before we know we're going to choose it. But he already also knows the good that he's going to bring from it. Right? That's true. So God, in, a, in what he permits... He always, his will is always to bring good out of everything. And uh, I thought that there was something along those lines. Because, of course, you can see that the way Augustine has set up his, his argument, first talking about God knowing everything, and then immediately having to go to the question of free will. I mean, that's classic, right? You still meet people who will say, well, I don't, I don't want to be part of a religion because who could worship a God who permits evil or does evil or we can blame evil on and so on. You can see that there's nothing new about these problems and conundrums no. because Augustine's answering the very same questions that are still asked today. Yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. Again, we, we, I, I was gonna, I was gonna comment upon that, but you know the answers already, so I won't, I'm not going to. Well, I think it's five, two thirds down. You know. He's, very clearly he says, for there is no nature whatsoever that is evil. Mm -hmm. In fact, quote, evil, unquote, is nothing but a term for the privation of good. And yeah. how, how does the good get deprived? Well, not God doesn't deprive it of anything. That's right. We misuse it. We uh, abuse it. And therefore, I, I, I love the discussion before that as well about the, the things that are that, that are natural that are actually part of creation. You know that there are you know, the Manichaeans would say that some things such as fire, cold, wild beasts, and the like are not good. Um, and he says, no, that's not true. It means that we do not we have not fathomed the good that's in them. And he calls us to be humble. And he gives also examples that poisons. Mm -hmm. used yeah. in the direct doses are actually medicinal that you know there's all sorts of uh uh, uh things that are on, on first viewing appear to be evil in a manichaean sense and it, and what we need to have is humility that we do not have full science here we don't have full knowledge right and when we don't know something we should we should actually humbly confess our ignorance rather than just presume that the, the knowledge we have is sufficient, which it clearly isn't. Well, I, I want to, I'll make my last contribution, a long citation, and I'll let you people comment and I'll end the session. Okay. But on page 58, uh, Augustine is re reflecting on what man has done, you know. What middle of the page, what wonderful, what astonishing heights human industry has reached in producing clothing and buildings. What progress it has made in agriculture and navigation. Now this, he's writing this in the year 400, you know. We, we think about it. what do we have to look upon after what he, uh, what artistry has contrived and achieved in making poetry of all sorts. This is before Shakespeare, before Dante. And pottery. This is pottery. Oh, pottery, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. He gets the oh, poetry. Pottery, he, he, that pottery he, yeah, he gets the poetry, though, too. He does. Does. <laughs> so we get the poetry, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> the of, of, of page 59, we get the poetry. Yeah. So yeah. Sculpture there, and painting. What wonders it is devised to perform and present in the theaters. Sheer marvels of those who see them, beyond belief to those who only hear about them. What a variety of ingenious methods he has invented for capturing, killing, and taming irrational animals. And these human beings themselves. So many kinds of poison, weaponry, instruments of war, not good, but still what, what we've done. How many medicines and remedies it has detected for preserving and restoring our mortal health? How many seasonings and condiments it has discovered to please the palate? What a multitude and variety of signs for expressing thoughts, persuading others, the language, alphabet, 
among which words and writings hold the chief place. What ornaments of rhetoric, and what an abundant diversity of poems delight the mind. What musical instruments and mode, I mean, there were, no, there were no symphonies in these days, you know. Can you imagine Augustine watching a symphony with, with you know, with violins and violas and cellos and basses and piccolos and flutes and oboes and bassoons and clarinets and French horns and trumpets and trombones and kill. I mean, whoo, okay. But yeah, but I bet the music was beautiful. In it, in it, even if it's more simple, we, and obviously we don't have any record of that now. But it's like we said earlier: you know, not knowing something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. What musical instruments and modes of singing is brought up to charm the ear? What skill in measurement and number? How acutely has come to grasp the motions and order of the stars? What enormous knowledge it has accumulated about the things of this world? Who could possibly describe all this? Especially, we wish not to gather it all up in one heap, but to dwell in each instance into it. So. Here's Augustine looking at all the things that man has done, mm -hmm. you know, and this is 1,500 years ago. Mm -hmm. I actually highlighted exactly the same passage, basically starting in the same place and ending in the same place. So <laughs> okay. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm happy to conclude my comments for, for today on that, but uh, if Vivian wants to all right. add something else, then feel free. No, I, I, I don't need to add uh, uh, much at all. In the other than you realize that Augustine used to be a Manichaean, dividing up the world between good and evil, and the body being principally evil. For him to now give this ode to of praise to human accomplishment, you can see how far he's come from. And 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 the and how can he see the real beauty of the human person? because he's come to love the God who's made the human person and now can reassess the good of this world and call it good. That's the beautiful thing about what's happened to Augustine. Amen. 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 All right, well, we bet, well, keep reading ahead. You might take, let's say, the next section or two of the two kingdoms and the role of Israel. But we have to be pilgrimage before that. Oh, did I miss pilgrimage? Yeah, I think pilgrimage and the two kingdoms will probably be sufficient. Oh, yeah, pilgrimage and two kingdoms. Sorry about that. But I'm glad I have these people who correct me. <laughs> I make my mistakes. All right. Thanks, everyone. We will see you, hopefully, Deo Volente next week for the Forum Book Club as we continue our discussion of St. Augustine, City of God, as selected and introduced by Hans Urs and Balthazar. If you enjoyed this discussion, Please help spread the word about the Forum Book Club by subscribing to the podcast and writing a review. You can sign up for weekly updates at formedbookclub.ignatius.com.